particular in the um, field doing different work related research. And luckily for the community of Gainesville, for ARCI, which is what we're gonna, how we're going to refer to the Avian Research and Conservation Institute here for the moment, you'll see a lot of the and a lot of ARCI. And Gina and the Swallowtail Kite and Ken Meyer, um, who is the, 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 what's the, the director of ARCI, executive director of ARCI, all found each other, and now we've had 20, uh, nearly 22 years of history of, of Gina just being doing incredible research with the small tuck kite and with other birds. But of course, the small tuck kite is a featured um, predator and animal and bird for this year's artwork. Thank you, Tracy um, Bachman, for doing artwork. Um, we, uh, ironically enough, don't actually have the small tuck kite. Um, at tomorrow's event, but it is one of the most special birds. I know that every bird is special to a bird, right? That's a lesson we learned. Don't try not to pick a favorite bird because the, the bird you're looking at, if you're a serious bird, the bird you're looking at is your favorite bird. The bird you're interacting with is your favorite bird. It should be that way because birds, being a birder, is all about the incredible amount of enjoyment you can get out of any given moment in the field, right? And I know that's, I'm preaching to the choir here because it's about 50% serious burden, if not more, right? But the small tail kite is, is special because it's one of those species that speaks to the general public. There are certain birds, or certain species of birds, and we call them spark birds, right? Birders have spark birds, but the general public has a spark bird too. And, uh, probably the best example is a pumpkin not necessarily any hummingbird, but the ruby-throated, because it's our species here. But what I want to say about the ruby-throated hummingbird is the same thing I want to say about the small tail kite, and it's that when a ruby-throated hummingbird goes sipping by you, you don't have to be a bird to experience that same feeling that we get about any given bird in the field. The ruby-throated hummingbird sparks wonder, like, just in a way that few birds do. And it sparks that kind of wonder for the general public. So you can be out in my yard gardening, and I don't really consider myself, I've never tried to identify a bird, but by golly, I know a hummingbird and what's in front of my head. And I stop and I wonder about it the same way that a serious lifelong bird does. And the swallow tail kite has that same effect. And so I love the fact that a person as also as Gina and the swallow tail kite have found each other because that bird speaks to this entire community. It speaks to anybody in its range that has an opportunity to observe a swallow tail kite just stops in their track, sometimes even if they're driving. <laughs> stops in their track and they feel that wonder. I probably should stop and let Gina tell you about this because she's got some research to get into. And how about this? How about, let me just hand the microphone over to Gina Kent. Yes. Okay. Yes, who's seen a small tail kite this year? So they are here, they are ready to breed, and they're ready to make more babies to make their whole uh, migration down to South America and back with, without their uh, their chicks. But um, the chicks are on their own, I'll get to that in a minute. But let's uh, go ahead and start, Adam. I really want to thank many, many donors and um, funding sources that we get. You can see we're a nonprofit. We get funding from a variety of um, Audubon chapters and uh, zoos and conservation societies, as well as federal and state um, grants and such. So what makes the swallowtail kite so amazing? Well, I think it's that fork tail and that wide, bright, uh, black and white striking uh, pose that you can see for miles. I mean, literally, if you have your binoculars and you see this little flitting long tail bird way out in the sky, black and white sh shape, you know what that is. And like Melba said, it sparks interest to people who don't even know what that bird is. It's like, what did I just see? Let me let me look that up. And they can find it and they can identify it. 
and uh, put a put a label to it. And sometimes that is is just really exciting for 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 people doing anything. But I, I do want to take a moment here and uh, and thank uh, photographers who have given us uh, pictures to use. Uh, Max Stone, if you don't uh, know him, he's a conservation photographer. Grew up here in Gainesville, um, now lives in South Carolina, but does fabulous work. I also have um, other photographers that are um, uh, noted in, in these pictures as well. So back in the 1940s, or pre-1940s, Swallowtail Heights used to nest all the way up into the Mississippi River Valley, so into parts of Wisconsin and uh, Minnesota. Uh, so like parts of 21 different states, and now after uh, a lot of lobbying and even some uh, persecution, their numbers have declined and constricted into the southeastern states. You can see how much of Florida is covered with swallowtail pike sightings, and, and these are breeding records for the most part too. We have the harbor in Florida, about uh, three fourths of the US population. And in other states, they are even considered um, threatened or endangered. So look at how tiny those little feet are. Swallowtail kites, they eat mostly insects. The adult's diet is almost completely comprised of eating beetles, wasps, uh, dragonflies. Um, and, and other insects, but um, go ahead and, and that that tail helps them maneuver and catch those little teeny bites um, out of the sky. So they're constantly on the wing, feeding as they go. They hardly land. Once they get up in the air, they're so aerodynamic that they will just take off and fly for the day and, and, and then roost at night. So to feed their chicks, though, you know, it would take a lot of effort to bring a teeny tiny bug back and forth and back and forth um, to feed their chicks. So they do feed them anoles and, um, and tree frogs and small, uh, like, rough green snakes that are found, uh, arboreal bee, um, even bats and um, baby birds that they'll bring to their um, nest sites. Swallowtail kites like to nest in kind of an uneven aged forest. This is a beautiful picture of a of Big Cypress Preserve down in uh, South Florida. And that's one of the strongholds of swallowtail kite nesting areas. But they are really adapting to other landscapes. For instance, they are using a lot of um, industrial timber forest plants because it kind of mimics that structural diversity that the kites like to feed in and then have um, mature trees to nest in. Um, this picture is a, a, a flutter dive, which is um, performed by an adult, usually the adult male, to, um, to uh, swoon the female, like that's a courtship display, um, beautifully captured by Ian Rice. So when the kites get back to the U.S. after their migration, they get straight into uh, these uh, courtship flights, and they also bring small uh, uh, courtship feeding uh, treats such as anoles and frogs. Um, so when the swallowtail kite is building a nest, they use a ton of Spanish moss. So if you're looking for a swallowtail kite nest, and you don't see any Spanish moss in it, it's not going to be a swallowtail kite nest. So again, back to how tiny their feet are. They have, oh, <laughs> that's fine. Um, so they, they choose these uh, places up in the tops of trees. So here's an example of an incubating female um, up in the top of a pine tree. That's the main tree that they'll be nesting in. Um, in, in Florida, but they'll also be found in cypress trees, oak trees, sweet gum, you name it, as long as it's a super emergent tree, so it's popping out of the canopy. You know, as graceful as they are, they, they really want a, like a runway to get into the nest, so it has to be a tree that's above the canopy so they can swoop in and out, kind of a, like just an open space to get in and out of their nest. 
Um, so again, Spanish moss in this tree holding together teeny tiny sticks because their feet aren't big to carry something that like an eagle would carry to their nest. You know, think of those big sticks you see in an osprey nest or an eagle nest. Um, so to hold all those little sticks together with that Spanish moss um, makes a great matrix to, to keep it all together. So a swallowtail coyote will lay one or two eggs, and then the chicks will, um, the incubation takes about 30 days, and then the chicks are in the nest about that long too, maybe 30 to 40 days. Uh, you can see that nice green lichen in there, that's the old man's beard lichen. And as the chicks um, um, continue to grow and continue to poop in the nest, the adults often cover it up with more of this um, lichen. So we, we worked with Max Stone and Stephen Bedard, the, the author, to do two online magazines so you can read more about our work with them and their uh, great writing. Uh, fabulous pictures and some video clips. Um, so I suggest you take a look at biographics, um, uh, story on swallowtail kites, as well as Audubon magazine. So I want to talk a little bit about our telemetry research. Since 1996, we've been putting on so, uh, satellite transmitters. So the, the, um, the uh, manufacturers and the equipment have changed over time, but um, we've, we've learned so much about the migration of swallowtail kites and um, nesting and foraging areas and roosting areas. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about our um, our research in um, these different technologies. What you're seeing here on this bird is a satellite transmitter. It's got an antenna and it's also solar powered. These things, we've had them last on small to heights. Uh, we take them as adults and they, um, they've given us data for over seven years for some cases. So we, we, can't, um, we can't talk about our telemetry research without talking about how we catch a swallowtail kite, and that is our connection to these wonderful education birds, such as Trapper here, who my uh, co-worker, well, they're both my co-workers, Amanda and Trapper, because Trapper here, I've known 19 years, she's since passed, but um, we work with wonderful rehabbers like Nan and Joe and other uh, folks across the state with their trained, love trained birds that can come out to help us um, capture a small town kite. So you might be like, how does that work? So our trained birds sit on a little perch, you know, they're trained with the, the nests and the leash, and um, they sit on a small perch, and above them is a big net. And that net is in a very open area, maybe 200 meters or so from the nest that we know of or an active territory. And so when the swallowtail kites the adults come by and they see an owl, that's a big predator. That's a very, you know, they do not want that bird around. You've heard of the mobbing, um, mobbing characteristics that birds do to owls, but swallowtail kites do too. They're, remember, they're, they're very graceful, but um, they're still pretty windy, so they never actually want to touch the owl. So what happens is that there's enough space there for the for the owl or for the swallowtail kites to swoop in to try to get that owl to get out of the way, and they get caught in the net and we're right there, and we get the bird, and the uh, owl goes away, and the bird gets a, the swallowtail kite gets a transmitter. <laughs> so very carefully, these uh, the we put a hood, just like a falconry hood, you can see on the, some of the captive birds are in a falconry demonstration. Um, it calms the birds down for the process. Um, it takes about 30 minutes to, to fit the transmitter on. It's a backpack style harness that we fit exactly to that bird. Not too tight, not too loose to get like a foot or their head or some stick spot in there. So it's a very, very serious process to to put that transmitter on. And then the bird's released right there on site um, within those 30 minutes, and we all get out of there so it can resume its, its regular plan for the day, hopefully. So what we get to see then, each color here is a different bird, a different track from a bird. Um, and 
And so we get, uh, now we get a GPS location every hour of the day. And we can use those locations to find nest, nesting spots, roosting places, foraging aggregations, and then of course, learn about their entire migration, uh, southbound to parts of South America and, and on back. So when we look at concentrations of different birds that are using areas, we may um, be curious about uh, how important those places are um, for swallowtail kites. So swallowtail kites, just like us right tonight, are gregarious. They like to be with each other. They like to come to food and drink sources. They use each other to find those things. Remember, the adults are eating, well, once the chicks fledge too, they're eating insects and they've got to find those ephemeral insect swarms. So what's better to be with a group of friends that are strikingly black and white that you can see very, very far away. So they attract each other, but they also want to spend the night together. They, they learn from each other um, and, and protect each other by being so close um, in these roost sites. So by looking at points that are concentrated um, from, from different maps, uh, different tracks, we, we like to go to these places um, in the, in, during the fall migration, they're getting together in these communal roosts where they are, are doing exactly that. They're gathering so they can find safety in numbers for sleeping and then places to feed to get ready for migration. So we call these the pre-migratory roosts. And over time, we've discovered over 12 of these important roost sites that they're using year after year. And some of them might be 40, 100 birds, or maybe 200, or even over a thousand. So we know of four different roost sites in Florida that are used over and over that have over 1,000 birds that are coming through there each year. And that's like, in one day. So there are more birds coming and there's more feeding. So it's like a constant wave of birds coming through. And with our telemetry data, because we know how long a bird stays in those areas, and some birds use a variety of the same different roost sites. So they might bounce from one to another. And it's interesting that a birds in South Florida, say Lee, Lee County or Collier County down by the Florida Panther National Wildlife Refuge, they may find one of these roosts in South Florida and spend their pre-migratory fattening period there. But also, we've had a bird go all the way up to North Carolina after breeding, like, and that's where it spends a month to get ready for migration. So again, they're using each other to find these food sources. They need each other to find these places so they can put on fat to do this long migration ahead of them. And this is exactly what's happening. They're crossing the Gulf of Mexico. And it's often right when hurricane season is starting. So they, if they plan it right, as you know, hurricanes are coming counterclockwise, right? So if they can plan it on the right wind, they'll get a great tailwind, right? So, um, the Yucatan Peninsula, that's where they're aiming for. But if they're caught in a, in a, in a crosswind, they'll be pushed off um, in, a, in a crazy direction and maybe to their death. And we've seen that with our tr transmitters, unfortunately, birds that come into bad weather patterns and, and don't make it. And we've seen birds over water um, that can actually uh, survive about four full days after that. Their, their energy and their water reserves just peter up. So here's an example of some of our migratory birds that we have tracked over time. Um, and we discovered this route. It was not known before we were able to track them with uh, these GPS transmitters. So um, we have a colleague in Louisiana that tagged birds as well. And you can see one bird it stayed over land and, and didn't do the risky overwater flight. But then the other one decided to go straight across uh, the Gulf of Mexico. But the ultimate end point is down mostly in Brazil, 
Mato Grosso, Mato Grosso de Sul, and uh, Juan Jorge right now. And so here's a, a this, this red area is kind of the crux of where we've had our swallowtail kites wintering. Uh, just want to point out, so there's seven different colors here, seven different um, pathways of migratory swallowtail kites in the wintering range in Mato Grosso de Sul, Brazil. These birds were from South Carolina, Jacksonville, Miami, Pinellas County, uh, and South Carolina, uh, I guess that's uh, in Louisiana, so, uh, and one in Georgia. So we had seven different places strewn across the, the U.S. breeding range, and they all found themselves in these same places. All our eggs in one basket, right? Like in the same tree on the same night. Just like fascinating to know that they, they've never seen each other. They've never, you know, they all end up there. And, and, and we've had pairs that are tagged, like a male and a female. They don't go to the same places. So it's, it's just really fascinating to know that all these birds are ending up in these same places. So they're congregating again, these big migratory roosts, and feeding together just like they do in Florida. And the area looks like this. It's open uh, farmland, a lot of cattle ranches. It's the hado, it's called. It's got scattered trees so they can roost. And then you see these little brown clumps out here. Um, those are termite mounds. This is not actually my size, but I don't know. <laughs> But um, swallowtail kites love to eat termites when they're in their, um, they, they have a flighted stage where they go explore and then find new uh, mounds. And uh, the wings are not the digestible, so I, I had the fortune of going down to see them feeding on these termite mounds and they're plucking up all the wings and they're just fluttering down around you. And it's just beautiful. <laughs> So if I showed you this picture, like, yeah, that's like a South Florida ranch. Well, it's, it's Brazil. So it's very, very similar to what they, they're hanging out over here. So big swamp areas, they like to um, use these edges to find um, you know, insects that might be on the treetops and then find communal roosting areas um, where they can um, sleep the night and start over. But a lot of these areas, these family farms are being purchased and changed to large-scale agriculture, uh, soybeans and uh, sugar cane. And obviously this situation is not compatible with swallowtail kite health. Um, no places to, to uh, perch or feed. Um, if, they, if there's insects, they're using a ton of pesticides and herbicides. We've had swallowtail kites die in South America. This should be the time when they're just on vacation. They just have to maintain, they just have to survive to their next meal and, and be comfortable. They're not feeding chicks, they don't have to defend the territory. And so they, uh, uh, yeah, so we're wondering is it because they are being, uh, if there's a, uh, pesticides that they're coming across in some of these places. So I overlaid the southbound and northbound migration track. They're very, very similar. But let's look at the Caribbean, that big black arrow. If we zoom in, uh, so each bird now is a different color. This is on the northbound migration. You can see they, they lead from the um, tip of the Yucatan. They don't really try to hit the peninsular part of Florida. Um, they, they actually go straight up the gulf because it's safer, right? It's like a catcher's mitt. If they get the right tailwind, they'll get propelled right there. If they miss the tip of Florida, they stick a little farther south, they are way out into the Atlantic. They might hit a Bahama Island, a Haitian Island, but it, they're, they're off course and it's more dangerous. So these technologies have shown us this little glimpse into swallowtail kites lives and we're learning more and more each time we have so many more questions to, to answer and you know just makes us want to learn more about these birds and their fabulous migration so we hope that our birds get back safely and get to start this process of breeding and migration all over again
So a few things you can do is check us out on the web, or we have a Facebook page and a blog where we're following up our swallowtail kites that are migrating right now. Uh, we've got six that have returned to uh, Florida and South Carolina, and um, waiting on two more. Um, our website is, is here. Um, at the top, you see a Get Involved button, and there you can report your swallowtail kite sightings. We'd love to hear from you. Next. And we also have a program called Eyes on Kites to monitor swallowtail kite nests. So if you are fortunate to find swallowtail kite nesting behavior, we'd love to learn about those nests. Okay, thank you so much. I'm happy to answer questions, but uh, we might move on and I'll be, I'll be here all evening. So come up to say hi. Have a bit of time for a sudden question and answer. Uh, this is a recorded microphone, so perhaps, perhaps you can approach with your question. I saw my hand go up already, Debbie. Um, Daryl, Debbie leaned over hands at the moment. It was like, Debbie, Daryl, you want to come on up and ask your question right through the microphone? Or I can come over here. She's coming over here. Very good presentation. I was wondering um, in the fall when there down in South Florida, there are these three owners before they leave. I assume that's a lot of private property. Is there any um, chance of trying to preserve that long term to protect those roosts because they're like competitive roosts each year? Right. So, the, the places where these roost sites are, that is one of our concerns, is making sure they're unprotected and not not uh, going to be bothered by any influence of land use change or even human, human traffic. <laughs> so um, some of them are on uh, public properties and, and inaccessible, but the, the ones, the bigger ones that are on private lands, those people do know about it and uh, seem to be happy to keep them as is and, and private and unavailable to other people to, to come in. So that's good for that. Look up your weight. Point out, have the population stabilized? Population is it stabilized? So it, it is. It's um, the the numbers in Florida and throughout the U.S. seem to be stable and or slightly increasing, which is great. What's not happening is uh, necessarily the the recolonization of that ground. Uh, the whole um, uh, the places where they used to be nesting in. For the 1940s. But since the swallowtail kites are so social in every aspect, including nesting, what we expect to happen is those northernmost nesting areas will start budding out and they'll, they'll start breeding a little farther north, um, slowly by slowly. <laughs> Shout it out. Right. right, so um, swallowtail kites, once the, they, their chicks fledge, they will feed them, they'll train them on, on, on how to feed and getting ready for migration, but then the adults take off. Once the, once the chicks uh, are old enough and they, they are strong enough, they will actually stay a little longer, maybe to build a little more muscle, but in their brain, it teaches them to go. They, they want to migrate as well. So they, they make the trip without any adult supervision. <laughs> yeah. There was a question in the back. You were just on your way up. So I'm aware of the back to Is 
like percentage wise do they put on pre-migration good question how much weight are they putting on pre-migration you know i know it's for uh songbirds that they're trying to double their weight and it's probably very close i mean so on top it's their weight is mostly in those feathers right that's that's a lot um they weigh about 450 to 500, 500 grams uh in general and um no, I've not caught a bird right before migration, so I imagine it could be fun. Thank you. I'll give another round of applause. Before I go to the road, my Some of you might be looking for a break uh, to do whatever and give another drink. Just ask you to go ahead and do that as you need to. Work. I, uh, before I introduce uh, Jack Davis, I did want to say something about uh, something else about pines predators. As I think I did mention when I had the opportunity to do so earlier, it is a fundraiser. Uh, tonight, as so of tomorrow, we'll get the fundraising for us. The people who come to the event, and many of you will, maybe, uh, you're going to donate some money as essentially a ticket to get in. Tonight, we have no such tickets. Uh, but we are still raising money for the exhibitors and rehabilitators and educators that are going to be at the event. And one of the ways that you can raise money tonight is by buying one of Jack Davis's books. And you can also buy the For the Birds Extra Pale Ale that this part of, uh, part of this party is about the release of that beer. Um, Christine and John Denny have done this special limited release in such a way that part of the proceeds are going to go to uh, the exhibitors and educators who are participating in the programs. So please do buy for the birds extra bail ale the t-shirt, the same as the case of the teacher. Okay. I'm new of Jack Davis for a while because it's, uh, when you have a Pulitzer Prize winning author in your community and you like to read, then you tend to get, you tend to know these things. But I had the opportunity a few years ago to actually sit in the studio of WUFT during the pledge drive uh, with Jack. And Jack and I uh, spent three hours uh, speaking to the community about the value of supporting public radio. But I got to know Jack well enough then um, to call him a friend and just a few months ago, so I've been in contact with Jack here and there over the last few years, uh, but a few months ago, 
Uh, Ingrid and I had the honor of spending an entire six or more hours uh, out in the field with Jack, because Ingrid and I do uh, Project Evil Watch, which is uh, a program run by the State Audubon Society in Florida, Florida, Florida. And uh, the volunteers who have access to data about where eagles nests are located, we go out into the field and we got to spend uh, out a day out in the field with Jack. We went to six or seven different nests and had a fantastic time. Um, and we got to talk quite a lot about his book. And I think at that time we had already determined that we were going to have to do something special during this year's months of predators. And it eventually turned into a book, which Jack has done with many, more than a handful of since the book was released on March 3rd. Um, we also have the honor of having one of Jack's, uh, the subject of actually two of the subjects of Jack's book. If you count Thunder, who's not the same bald eagle that Jack writes about in the book, but is nonetheless uh, Patrick Bradley's eagle that uh, goes with him on display currently. Um, Jack actually wrote about Sarge, who's another dear eagle to Patrick, that's Thunder, as I mentioned. Um, in the book, which is a wonderful book, I have read most of it already. Uh, Jack does a great job of telling stories that involve people who are a lot like you. And I mean that because the people who are present, the, the reason I say that is because the people who are present here tonight are of the same mindset and we do the same type of work that the people who brought the bald eagle back from the brink of extinction. So you might not think that you have done as much as some of the people that Jack writes about in the book, but the point is you're the same kind of people. So it's great to have you here tonight. Patrick, if you have I think, six full pages dedicated to the story of Patrick Bradley in the epilogue of the book, four or six pages. And what it talks about, what Jack talks about is how much Patrick has done to bring people and birds who need rehabilitation together. Jack writes really well about Patrick. It, it, it's very, very personal stuff. But the Pulitzer Prize winning author who writes about you in the book that follows the Pulitzer Prize winning book, which incidentally, you did bring copies of the But when that person writes about your personal story, I guess you are, have a sort of, you know that the world is going to know your deeply personal information. So I'll go ahead and tell you one of my favorite parts of the book is the story about how when Patrick was kind of coming to terms with the effects of post-traumatic stress disorder from the service of the military and had on him, one of the things that you find out about Patrick is that he had to find some way to deal with his PTSD because he was in he was in uh, dealing with that PTSD before he knew what to do about it, he actually managed to break the jaw of one of the officers who, uh, who had a lot to do with, with uh, whether Patrick could stay in that facility or not. So sent him off into the middle of Saskatchewan, and that's where you found out that the rest of your life was going to be dedicated to all demons, right? So I should probably go ahead and turn this thing over to Jack. I don't think he's going to talk as much about Patrick as I've already talked about, but he does have really good stories to tell also about how special all the eagles in Alaska and Marion County were in that phase of recovery from um, the near extinction that DT brought and, and, and also persecution uh, and all other sorts of ways. But if I do want to say, you are going to have a chance to have your book signed by Jack and, and you can approach and talk to him as well. Uh, Jack has heard from a lot of different people and he has heard a lot of stories that people have to tell about their own experience with all the eagles. All that's fair. You might not have anything new for Jack to hear. And your your jokes about his baldness are probably not new either. And I do want to tell you. Let me just say this really quick. I have to say something I have to say about Patrick. Patrick is sensitive to what you have to say about Jack's baldness because it's alopecia. But Jack doesn't slap. Patrick doesn't slap. Can I say, get your 
or Pulitzer Prize winning author's name out your mouth. I do want to say it's really wonderful to be out here and be in front of so many people who have an appreciation for, for birds of, of all types. And Gina, you're, I mean, your presentation was so fabulous. It was fascinating to learn that the domestic life of swallowtails are very, very similar to the bald eagle. Migration patterns completely different. The bald eagle, it's very random in its migration patterns. Um, uh, it, it defies logic when it comes to birds. Uh, we can talk about that later. And but and I don't have slides with the show. I, I thought that only Gina and her wonderful slides would be best, but you look in your classes and, and, and contemplate whether you want another uh, another round. And yeah, indeed, get another round, have a few, uh, and then get loose with your money. Because for every Bald Eagle book sold, $9 goes to the Fourth Bird Benefit. For every um, Gulf of Mexico book uh, sold, $5 goes to the Benefit. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, we've been sold like about 10 books so far, which, which, is, which is nice. But we, we can do better, right? So what, you know, the reason why I wrote this book about the, about the bald eagle is because today, this is a spark bird too. Uh, or I don't refer to it as a spark bird. I like to say that it's a, you know, book the guy in the room next to you uh, bird. You know, it, 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 it evokes that kind of excitement when you see one crossing the, crossing the sky. And the reason, one reason why it evokes so much time when we came across the sky is because 10, 15 years ago, we didn't see bald eagles that much. Now we see so many of them. And each year, there are more and more bald eagles out there. And we love them. They become something of a novelty for us. I grew up in Florida on Tampa Bay in the 1970s. I went to school, I went fishing every day in the bay. And I never saw bald eagles, I never saw ospreys. I couldn't catch anything other than damn appropriate. Uh, and I saw gulls, I saw brown pelicans, but they just didn't exist because the bay was on the verge of ecological extinction or ecological collapse, I should say. So that meant no seagrass, meant no marine life, meant no fishing bird, no fishing raptors like the bald eagle. The bald eagle would take food out of the sky and take it off the land, but it likes its fish. And it builds its nest. Uh, a mile, well, excuse me, within 100 yards uh, of water, typically. And, uh, and so when we were in this, by 1970, when, when barely one third of all the waters in the United States, fresh water and most waters were safe for swimming and fishing, that meant they weren't feeding the bald eagles. So because we're seeing them 50 years ago today, Congress would, by the way, Decisive bipartisan support, a rare thing in the state. Pass the uh, Clean Water Act. Uh, and it has done a tremendous job of cleaning up possessory environments as habitats for those birds like ospreys and pelicans, brown pelicans, which disappear from the northern Gulf altogether. Brown pelicans, the, the uh, state bird of Louisiana in the 60s was gone. And and, uh, but anyway, the, ball, the Clean Water Act has done a tremendous job cleaning up uh, the waterway habitat of, of birds that rely on, on those habitats. And so, because we see so many bald eagles today, and we're so excited about quote, this quote unquote novel bird, uh, I decided uh, to write this book because maybe people would like a little bit of more about this bird they're starting to see. And the book is a cultural. Uh, both a, a cultural and a natural history of the bald eagle. And in terms of its cultural history, the bald eagle has been around probably a million years. There's some 60 eagle species around the world. Uh, and, and eagles date back millions of years, but the bald eagle, the best we know, has been around about a million years. But 
and it has long been for thousands of years years an important bird in the culture of many Native American birds. It's a spirit bird, it's a messenger uh, with the creator and ancestors. Uh, its feathers are a conduit to uh, between the earth and, and, and the other world. Um, but with Americans, it's a fairly recent relationship. And I want to I want to start that's kind of in a part for the second discussion I can start uh, our discussion about that relationship between Americans in the, in the colony of 1782. And coincidentally, while I was sitting over there, my phone buzzed, and it was a text from uh, WUFT PBS television uh, reminding me and others that Ken Burton has a new film out on Ben Franklin. So, what do you guys, what, what do you guys know about Ben Franklin and Paul? What's that? Turkey, what about the turkey? You like you? He wanted the, so you, you think that he wanted all kind of the turkey for the great seal of the United States or the national bird? You're wrong. Completely wrong. That's a myth. He did compare the morality between the bald eagle and the, and the, and the turkey. He said the turkey was this honest, hardworking bird, uh, and the bald eagle was a, a, a rank coward and thief. But he never proposed a bald eagle for the great seal of the United States. He proposed something altogether different. And what he proposed will blow your mind. And I'm not going to tell you because I want you to buy a book. <laughs> now, what is the national bird in the United States? You're wrong. We don't write. We don't. We read the book. Well, my sister read the book. We don't have a national bird in this country, maybe you've heard not. Congress has never uh, anointed a national uh, a, a bird to be the national bird of the United States, or any Indian species to be a national bird of the United States, uh, as it has uh, anointed the bison as a national animal, the rose as a national flower, the tree is the, the oak tree as a national tree. Uh, but tomorrow, Congress, and don't put this beyond them, could actually designate, so the post hasn't been filled, could actually designate as a national bird the sidewalk fish. Ah! And as I said, I wouldn't put it beyond them. <laughs> so we don't have a national bird snip, but uh, we think it is because in 1782, it had been on the great seal of the United States. Uh, and it was an ideal, it took, it took Congress, you think Congress has a problem today. Um, back in those days, it took six years for Congress to devise a seal that everybody could agree on, everybody in Congress could agree on. They went through three committees. The first committee was Jefferson, Adams, and Franklin, stellar cast. They failed miserably, largely because of what Franklin won. Uh, and uh, two other committees failed, a number of consultants failed. Finally, 1792, a year away from signing the peace treaty with Great Britain, the United States still had no seal. It needed a stamp. It's the, the country's ID badge. And it needed a seal to put on the peace treaty. And so Charles Thompson, the president, or excuse me, the secretary of the Continental Congress, finally decided we're going to put the damn ball on the Great Seal. And he said he, did, he insisted that the, the eagle on the great seal be an American ball eagle. Those are his words. And it was an ideal choice. And here's why the ball eagle is truly an all American bird. It lives nowhere else outside of North America. And it's a highly identifiable bird um, with this white head and white tail, like the beautiful thunder here next to Patrick Craig. And now, you say, well, you know, eagles have been on uh, the seals of nation states, the postcards for a long time. Yes, dating back to the Greeks, uh, ancient Greeks, and, and Romans. But the eagle on the great seal of the United States is the first identifiable species. Uh, every other eagle is, is non morphological, uh, just this generic eagle. Uh, and so Charles Thompson picked out 
and all American her. And at the time, the United States was desperate to assert its own identity separate of uh, Great Britain and other European powers to say, we are one unto ourselves. We are not like Canada, the Oslo, no offense to Canada, the offspring of Great Britain, or, you know, we're not part of the Commonwealth. All in American birth. But also, look at this bird. Look at thunder. I mean, what does she convey? Oh, she, she loves it. Either. What does she convey? Strength and courage, in, except for her tether, freedom. Uh, and again, those were the ideals that the United States wanted to associate itself with. Uh, so ideal. But also, look at Thunder suborbital ridge, you know, that bony ridge above her, her eyes. That acts as a sun bible for Paul Eagle. But for us, for early Americans, it was the ideal don't tread on me stairs. And Americans love the bald eagle when we put on the great, the great seal of the United States. They love the image, but they hated the species. Species is a top predator, uh, and it was accused, wrongfully accused of all sorts of crimes, quoted from crimes, stealing livestock such as sheep and calves and pigs, all of which are too heavy. A bald eagle with momentum, a large bald eagle with momentum behind it. Can perhaps carry five, lift five pounds out of the water or off the ground, but really not much more. It's certainly not a calf or a pig. They can steal chickens, uh, which they do all the time. There's one free range chicken uh, farmer up in uh, southwest Georgia referred to his chickens who attract 80 to 100 bald eagles every winter. Um, he calls them a low hanging fruit, but they can't. They can't put those that other livestock, but they will choose an enormous dog, John James Audubon. And I love the local Audubon groups, by the way. So, no offense to you guys. National, I got to give them an opinion about that. But the local groups are great. But John James Audubon hated bald eagles. And if you want to know why, you have to idea. <laughs> and if you want to know what he wanted to refer to his country, uh, but but also mothers were warned: don't leave your infants unattended outside, unless you want to call eagle to steal it away and take back to its nest. And this was a myth that persisted in children's books, in what the most popular reader in America at the time, uh, McGuffey's reader. Only the Bible was read more than McGuffey's reader. Uh, this myth was just in film, in early film, well into the 20th century. One of our greatest um, bald eagle or rapper heroes in this country, Doris Nagar. Some of you may be familiar with her. She was really, she lived here in Florida, so she got started in her business. Um, even she, in the 1950s, uh, uh, believed in that myth that bald eagles would steal her child. And, and take them away to their, their nest. So what did Americans do? They treated bald eagles like they did mountain lions, wolves, coyotes, uh, and bear. They shot bald eagles. These the bald eagles be shot. I did a, a search on uh, doing research on newspapers.com. It's one of the database of daily and weekly newspapers across the country. Using the search days, 1850 to 1920. 1850 to 1920, three words of quotation marks. So I have an exact match. All the shot. I got 140,000 hits. Alaska, 1970. America is going to war in Europe. It is going to take an image of all the of the bird of freedom with it into that war. And that very year that America wins war in Europe, 1970, Alaska, the territory of Alaska, adopted all the amounts. Which remained in effect until 1952. And during that period, if you turn in a set of talons, you got 50 cents. Uh, there were people who became full time all eagle bounty hunters. And during that period, from 1917 to 1952, Alaska paid bounties on all, over 128,000 ball eagles, accused of being unnecessary competition for salmon fishing. 
with a ball that goes feet on it, falling down standing. They're no good for the market. Yeah, there was this boundary. Uh, so by the end of the 19th century, by the late 19th century, we had pushed because we shot and killed and clubbed and poisoned so many bald eagles. We pushed them to the brink of extinction. Let me put this in perspective. When Congress adopted the ball of the um, Great School in the United States in 1782, bald eagles were nesting every mile to two mile along the Delaware River. Okay, this was in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. That was the first where the first Congress met. At the end of the 19th century, there were no bald eagles nesting in Pennsylvania, no bald eagles nesting in New York, no bald eagles nesting in New England outside of Maine, no bald eagles nesting across many of the southern states. DDT is not the factor here. We are a direct assault. We hear about the slaughter of the bison, but we don't hear about the slaughter of bald eagles. But Here's one thing that's great about this story. So it's really a truly an American conservation success story. We redeemed ourselves. We said enough is enough. We don't want the ball to go the way of the passenger pigeon, the last of which died in 1914 in the Cincinnati Zoo, or the Carolina Turkey, the last of which died in 1918, also in the Cincinnati Zoo. So the caveat here is don't go live there. <laughs> and comes so Congress under pressure, not from National Audubon. National Audubon would not stand up the ball uh, and would not take a stand against the uh, the the Alaska boundary. Now, state groups did, the national did, because it was the person in charge of National and then was. A, was a Floridian from Archer, Florida, T. Gilbert Pierce, who had a closing relationship with the ammunition company. Uh, and he cared more about game birds than, he, than any other birds. Uh, and, but pressure was put on Congress to protect the bald eagle. In 1940, Congress passed the Bald Eagle Protection Act, uh, making the bald eagle the first individual species to be safeguarded by federal law. The bald eagle got its own law in 1940. Uh, and uh, Congress recognized that to uh, lose this, uh, the, the living species behind the symbol would be duplicitous. It would undermine the integrity of the great seal of the United States. Um, yeah, if the, the bird of freedom that was denied its own freedom, the dog, if it went extinct. Five years later, what happened? In 1945, America wins the war. It beats the Japanese, it beats the uh, Germans, and now who is the one to beat? The Bob. And what's the date in August 1945? DDT into the general market. And we just blanket the lower 48. It's phenomenal we did with DDT. Not just in agriculture, not just in poetry, but our own homes, our neighborhoods, around our, our schools. Uh, you know, we not only did we soak the land, we soak our kids. And so, Bird, as you know, I don't think we're going to this, Bird Life just plummeted after 1948, 45, including the ball of eagle. And the person who made the first connection between DDT and the decline of the ball of eagle population was a man by the name of Charles Burley, a retired banker. Winnipeg, Winnipeg moved to Tampa with his family in the late 1930s. This is a banker, all head of banker from Winnipeg. He starts climbing long way pines and long way pines to ban Kibas. Nobody else is doing this at the time. What was this guy thinking in retirement? Uh, no other retiree was thinking the same thing or has ever stuck off the same thing. Um, but for 20 years, until age 79, he climbed. These pine trees. He has estimated he climbed uh, over 1,100 pine trees and dated over 1,200 eaglets, uh, mainly in Florida during that period. So, age 79, never fell out of the tree. He fell off a chair once, but not out of a tree. Uh, and, uh, and he, in the 1950s, he saw the bald eagle population in his ivory district just plummet in Florida. And so in 1958, he wrote a, a 
article for Nature magazine making that link between EDT and Pinvaldi. Rachel Carson talks about him in Silent Spring. One of the many Florida heroes uh, in the book, Charles Burley, Doris Banger, who I mentioned, uh, and of course, uh, Patrick Bradley, truly one of, one of my heroes. A phenomenal individual. You really, you really love reading about him in the, in the book and what he has done uh, with rappers and uh, in uh, animal assisted uh, therapy. He's a pioneer uh, what he's done. He's had phenomenal success. Uh, and so, anyway, by 1963, as you probably know, the bald eagle nest count in that year, which is the first count of nests, bald eagle nests uh, in the lower 48, was under 500. We pushed the bald eagle to the brink of extinction again, and this uh, indirect assault, not intentionally, but in this direct, indirect assault. But they were your dangerous ourselves again. What happened in 1972 is a pivotal year, it's a watershed year for the bald eagle and for Americans as well. 1972. Uh, Congress adds rappers to the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. 1972, it increases the penalty for harming a bird, a bald eagle, under the Bald Eagle Protection Act, which by then is a bald eagle, bald and golden eagle. Uh, 1972, the EPA bans the sale of DDT in the United States. 1972, 50 years ago this October, Congress passed the Clean Water Act. So the chess pieces are in place. U.S. Fish and Wildlife takes note, and it launches in the bicentennial year of the United States, 1976. Launches eagle restoration programs. This guy was involved in, uh, among other things, he was involved in uh, eagle restoration uh, programs across the country. Phenomenal success. Florida, all the eagles around here were heroic. And I'm not exaggerating. Of all the heroes in this book, my favorite are the bald eagles. But bald eagles around here, I didn't know about any of this until I started writing this book. Very few of them, Alabama, Georgia, Tennessee, uh, Mississippi had no nesting bald eagles in the 1970s. The Carolinas sporadically one or two a year. Florida had a 19, in 1970 about 300. The low had been 88. Statewide in the early 1960s by 1970, And the way this, these restoration programs work is Fish and Wildlife and state agency officials would take eaglets out of nests where one eaglet per nest, as long as there were at least two eaglets in nests, out of healthy areas like northern Michigan and Minnesota uh, and in Canada and Alaska, and relocate those eaglets to the barren area. Uh, places like New England, Massachusetts, where there were no nesting bald eagles uh, in the 1970s, uh, and raised them in these what they call hat boxes, the big giant lion cages on stilts outdoors, so they'd be exposed to the elements. And, and they would move them into these hat boxes about five weeks a day, and they would imprint, they would imprint on the territory. And in their minds, that territory became their natal territory. And what do bald eagles do? They go back when they reach mating age or breeding age. They go back to their natal territory um, to to uh, to to breed, and so it's phenomenal success. But in the South, Florida didn't have enough bald eagles to give up eaglets. So somebody, you know, write about the book. Great idea. Comes up with a plan. Says let's take bald eagle eggs out of the nest. Take them up to the Sutton Avian Center in Oklahoma, raise them underneath hens, or, or incubate them underneath hens, and hatch them, of course, move them into the hack boxes, feed them behind, from behind blinds until they're five weeks old, and move them into these states of Alabama, Mississippi, and Georgia, and Tennessee, and so in Oklahoma. And ultimately, in the University of Florida was uh, really led this. The, this process. And over the course of four years, four or five years, um, bald eagles in the, in the eagle's nests that were poached, if you will, were all from Latcher County and five counties around Latcher County in the 1980s. 
Uh, and all the eagles of Florida gave up 275 eggs to this cause. The hatch rate, 100%. Isn't that fantastic? And they didn't lose any population because they took the eggs soon after they hatched, and they took both eggs, you know, however many eggs, typically two, sometimes one, sometimes three. But they took all the eggs out of the nest early on, uh, so the female would double clock, so she would lay another set. Um, and so those are real heroes. So I was having a conversation with uh, recently with the the speaker, uh, the former speaker of the house, Chris Prowls, and uh, I said, Chris. I said, well, then this was actually just before the book came out on March 1. I said, Chris, when the book comes out, I'm coming to you because I want a monument in front on 441 in front of Page Prairie State Preserve to these heroic fall eagles. So a week later, I get an email from one of his uh, deputy chiefs of staff. He said, can you tell me more about Florida Bald Eagles and this restoration? Because the speaker wants to include a mine in this year's budget for a mine. So, so I'm really excited about that. But write, write your state representative, email them, and just none a little bit. But I think what I think we'll get. It's not a lot of money. And I've got already got already have a private donor lined up um, to who will sponsor, pay for an education kiosk uh, or room at the State Reserve uh, Visitor Center to tell the story uh, because it really is a great story. So fantastic success this restoration program, but it would not have been a success without the bald eagles themselves. They mate for life. They maintain a fidelity to their nests as long as those nests exist. Nests can exist for 20, 30, 40 years. And they get bigger and bigger every year. I love what you said about the Spanish mom and the swallow kite because in Florida, in the southern states where there's Spanish moths, they, they use the Spanish moths to line the bowl of their nests where their, their chicks hang out. And they refurbish them every day. And when they come back to their nest every breeding season, they spend a, a few weeks refurbishing the nest, adding on to it. Those nests can reach, there's one nest I write about in the book, reaches, it reaches 10 feet across, 12 feet deep. The old hickory it was in, in Ohio, for me in Ohio said, what the? <laughs> I'm getting no more. Stop it. And it clapped. And the scientists, uh, who was studying this nest uh, estimated that weighed two tons. So they maintain the fidelity to their nest life. It's destroyed. They immediately begin building again. If they lose the mate, they immediately go out to find a new one. Um, and they raise their young with such care. They feed them so well. That when their young leave the natal territory for 16 and 20 weeks, they typically weigh more than their parents. So just like the swallow type, they wait for the young to leave, wait for them to migrate. These guys are just you know, there. Yeah. So Florida birds will migrate as far as Canada. Some of them, not all of them. The only, the only consistency in the migration pattern of bald eagles is the northern bald eagles fly south and the southern bald eagles fly north. Uh, uh, Saskatchewan bald eagles will fly to Colorado after breeding season. The Colorado bird can fly to Saskatchewan. I don't know if they wave each other when they pass, but they do this. Now, some bald eagles, the, the adults say, okay, I don't want to fly to Canada. I can find fish up in Georgia. Or I don't know if this guy's got a great chicken. Or go there. Uh, the young are a little bit smarter. The, the, the adults are a little bit smarter. They, some of them don't migrate very far. Some of them just stick around and all season. Branch. Uh, but in any case, they raise their, their, their baby with such care that they are in good shape when they leave their natal territory. And then after they leave, the female goes in her direction, the male goes in his direction. 
which just occurred to me that the secret behind that life on a life. But they always go back to that same now. Um, so we have to credit not only ourselves for our changing environmental sensibilities and our love of the and fish and wildlife and, and state uh, wildlife officials, but with the birds themselves. 2007, uh, it, well, actually, it was ready to come off the endangered species, endangered species less than 1999. Uh, but because of bureaucratic delay in Washington, uh, it didn't. Uh, it wasn't delisted until 2007, uh, when the population was the nesting population lower 48 was uh, between 10 and 11,000. In the 2010s, the vulnerable population quadrupled. In the 2010, that's why we're seeing so many. And today, the volatile population countywide is uh, approximately 500,000, equivalent to the estimated population at the time the Europeans first began settling North America. So when we see a bald eagle across the sky, not only is it a book of the guy on the ribs, uh, you know, next to you in the moment, it's also you can look at that ball of the and see it as a, as a path on our own to the back. Because we come to love the ball of the eagle. And uh, it's, that's evident in its current population. So why don't I stop there? If there are any further questions that I have in a couple of minutes, I'm happy to answer them. I did that well, no questions. <laughs> okay. I okay. Remember, nine dollars for Paul Angle goes to um, and I'm not making any money on it. Nine dollars goes to um, for the birds. Five dollars if you go. Yes, we have a question. What is the average life span? Average lifespan of all needles. So in, in the wild, I'll tell you, I'll tell you both. In the wild, they can live well into their thirties. The oldest bald eagle that we know of in the, in the wild died at age thirty-eight, unfortunately was hit by a car. Uh, bald eagles can live into the forties. Yes, this guy is. You, uh, Patrick, got a report. Okay. The one that was hit by the car. Yeah. Why'd you get that report? Oh my God! Greg, I didn't even know that when I wrote the book. Patrick painted that eagle. Oh my God. Oh, I, I love that, Patrick. I love that. Uh, in the end, in captivity, they've been known for women to their 40s. Um, Thunder here is 29. 29, right? Thunder is 29 and looking beautiful, but didn't she? Any other questions? Love us ready. This, this way he was when we were doing the UFT fundraising. Get away with the mic. All right, I'm going to hand it over to you. No, no. Oh. You're going to sit down and sign Yeah, I'm going to sign over here by from Ingrid so we don't have a, you know, a clock line. Okay. And I'm going to have a, a, a post it pad. If you, if you want your, your book personalized, please tell your name, okay? All right, thank you. All right, y'all, thanks for joining us for this evening's uh, broadcast of the presentations here at the For the Birds uh, release. Um, this video will be made available uh, on the, our alatraaudubon.org website uh, here in the next few days, and we'll upload this uh, presentation to our YouTube and social media as well. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for tuning in. And uh, we'll see y'all soon. Cheers, y'all.